So um, as you've heard, the topic for today is maybe a bit of a departure from the kind of things you've been hearing about this week. And the topic is the future of employment, and in particular how technological advances, uh, notably those within machine learning and robotics, are likely to affect the future of work. So this is often portrayed in the media as being about robots stealing jobs. Perhaps you've seen headlines along those sort of lines. And I don't know about you, but sometimes in reading those kind of pieces, particularly when it's you know, pretty late at night and uh, my code is still not working as well as I'd like, and I know that if I were to change one initialization parameter just a teensy bit, it would work even worse. I can't help but think that you know, this hype over algorithms actually taking people's jobs is a little bit overdone. <laughs> Maybe you've had that impression as well. So to answer that kind of criticism, I thought I might start out with a plot from one of my favorite studies of all time, which was of a cohort of judges tasked with awarding parole. So the y-axis of this plot is the fraction of times that the judges did award parole to parole seekers as a function of, on the x-axis, the ordinal position during the day. So you can see that they start out the day fairly generously inclined, only for that to wear off. They're perked up by their morning coffee, only for that to last only fairly temporarily. Lunch is another boost, but that lasts you know, only a very short period of time before the rest of the afternoon is more or less a complete write-off. So the first thing I want to say about this is that in today's proceedings, we're somewhere about here. So really, I've got no excuse whatsoever if you're not you know, positively uh, inclined in judging my talk. <laughs> but the other more serious point is that you know, humans aren't perfect, right? Human decision making is corrupted by all these kinds of heuristics and biases. And so even though the algorithms we develop might not be perfect either, they might still be better in some respects. And you know, certainly that they're not going to be affected by you know, how long it's been since the lunch break. So with that sort of motivation in mind, I thought I'd just roll through a few examples of where we're already seeing technology impacting on the world of work. And uh, well, actually, even before I do that, sorry, I've got this uh, little exercise I'd like you to undertake. So just take a moment and think about what it would take for an algorithm to automate your job or uh, you know, if you're not currently in employment, automate any job which uh, you're particularly well informed about. So having spent a couple of moments on that, now what I'd like you to do is to turn to the person to either your left or right, hopefully we can organize this in a decentralized way, and try and convince them that their job is automatable given you know, technology that's currently available. So then spend a few minutes doing that. Sorry to stop what I'm sure is a really interesting discussion. But um, could I now just get a, a bit of a poll of the audience? So could you please raise your hand if you were convinced by your partner that your job could be automated? Was there anyone? A few people, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, okay. Well, uh, thanks very much for that. And now what I thought I might move on to is just where I see, as I said, technology already kind of um, encroaching upon the world of work. So, the first sphere I thought I might speak about is kind of retail and sales jobs. And uh, you know, obviously there's been a huge boom in online retail in the last decade and a bit, driven by, for, for example, Amazon. And of course, machine learning has been at the heart of a lot of that in making uh, you know, product recommendations that are superior to humans, simply by virtue of having access to a much larger, larger set of data than any individual human salesperson ever would. Um, at the top right of the slide there, I've got a Xeos tablet, I'm not sure if you've used one of these things, but what they can do is essentially replace some of the tasks of a waiter or waitress in a restaurant by automating the taking of orders, taking of payment, and even potentially doing some of that recommendation, right? I mean, they can, by having you sign in, learn your preferences and recommend meals to you that they think they might like, that you might like. And the interesting thing actually with those kind of tablets is that in, uh, <coughs> you know, Allowing you to order, say, a triple chocolate sundae for dessert without actually forcing you to interact with another human being. Uh, some restaurants have seen dessert orders go by up by as much as 20% when these technologies are introduced. So that's another way in which these technologies can improve upon the human level of performance. And on the top left of the slide here, I've got the more recent example of Amazon Go. So I haven't been to this store, perhaps some of you have, but it's a kind of convenience store in Seattle. 
which is attempting to do away with checkout assistance altogether by tracking what you do in the store with uh, data from your phone using computer vision algorithms on, from cameras deployed in the store so that you can be automatically billed for whatever it is you pick up just as you exit the store. So if that technology proves itself, it's difficult to see it not affecting you know, employment in uh, retail uh, worldwide. Um, but it's not just kind of lower skilled occupations that are being affected. I thought I might speak a little bit about more traditional white collar occupations that are being affected by technology. A lot of people speak about lawyers being affected by technology and I think that is very much happening. So in particular in places like um, not trial lawyer work, you know, not standing up in front of a court, but anywhere that really just requires a lawyer to dig through files, for instance, like for example, a paralegal might do, like a contract lawyer or patent lawyer might do. We are already seeing algorithms put to those kind of purposes. And um, there was this article in the New York Times a few years ago in which someone was bemoaning the fact that he can no longer bill out people to do document review just because the algorithms have got so good at doing it in their place. More broadly speaking, there are algorithms that are used to write contracts now. There are firms like Contract Express. Of course, a lot of preparing most contracts is routine. That is absolutely something can be that can be automated. And there are even more sophisticated ends of um, uh, lawyering work that is beginning to be automated. So Allen & Overy, which is this big international law firm, is using a service that can apparently tackle quite complex multi-jurisdictional legal questions by you know, digging through um, prior examples of such legal questions that's uh, you know, encoded in documents that the algorithms can read. So um, something that's perhaps been even more impactful in the last few years is what's known as robotic process automation. I'm not sure if this is something that's crossed your radar, but uh, really what RPA as it's uh, come to be known as doing sounds trivial, which is like, so there's a lot of clerical work that requires not much more than like opening a file in Excel, copying the data into some other proprietary bit of software, literally copying and pasting data from one application to another. And RPA is kind of about learning to do that automatically. So there are these software bots that will observe how a worker does this task and over time automate it. So uh, firms like Automation Anywhere, Datamatics, Blue Prism uh, have for some clients automated as much as 35% of this kind of work. And the firms that have been affected very much see these bots as alternatives to workers. So some firms, um, you know, give them names like uh, Polly, I think, in one instance, and are actually seeing them as a replacement for some of the human workers that they'd previously used. Uh, my next example is accounting and auditing, another traditional white collar occupation, in some cases relatively well paid. Again, one to which algorithms have been very uh, heavily targeted in the last few years. So uh, 48 million Americans in 2014 used uh, services like TurboTax to prepare the tax returns. You can understand why. Uh, it's not a particularly pleasant thing to have to do and accountants are expensive. There are other services like Cashflow which are automating the processing of receipts and invoices. Again, something that's routine and able to be done by algorithms. More interesting to me are things like um, PwC's Halo for Journals, which is an attempt to automate some of the work that an auditor would do. So when you think about the limitations on a human auditor, really they're only ever going to be able to process a small sample, a mini batch, if you like, of a company's financial data. Whereas an algorithm is under no such limitations. So these services like Halo for Journals are actually thinking about what can be done by looking at not just all the data for a company, but all the data in real time, right? So no longer is the audit potentially a once a year or once every few year kind of thing. This could be actually be deployed in real time to flag up any anomalies as they're happening so that appropriate action can be taken in response. All right, so my next example is perhaps familiar to most of you. It's the rise of self-driving vehicles, autonomous vehicles. So when people think about this affecting the world of work, I think most people think about, you know, for instance, Uber's deployment of um, self-driving taxis. Of course, these self-driving taxis today still have a human in the car as well. And perhaps that is coming, but to me that's a little bit further down the road. Where I see these algorithms having real impact in the much shorter term,
are in places where there's a lot more structure to the type of task that's required. So um, for instance, in my native state of Western Australia today, uh, you've got these big open cut iron ore mines in the Northwest, which are uh, having worked there myself, fairly unpleasant places to work. They're hot, they're dusty, they're very far from civilization. And historically you would have to pay a human driver something like 180,000 Australian dollars to go and work there. So the economic incentive for the big miners, Rio Tinto and BHP Billiton, was enormous to try and automate that kind of work. And in fact, they've done it, basically. So now um, in the Pilbara region alone, there are 150 of these self-driving trucks. And um, not just are they automating the work that a human driver would do, the, the fact that these trucks have now have to, had to be equipped with um, a wide variety of different sensors, they're recording their environment to a much greater degree than has ever been possible in the past, means that they're delivering all kinds of advantages to these miners far beyond what a human driver would have done. So because they're recording in much greater detail the amount of um, iron ore that's being picked up, you know, they're recording details of failures of different components of the truck, they can begin to optimise the production in a way that was never possible in the past. And the final example on the slide here is that of the um, uh, automation of the delivery of meals and medicines around hospitals. So again, this is a task that is really quite structured. So um, I, I didn't really get onto it, but in a mine, of course, you're not re really worried about other traffic on the road. You know, you can control the number of trucks that are going around. Um, there aren't stoplights to worry about. You can make sure that there aren't many humans in the way, all that kind of thing. And inside places like hospitals, like warehouses, like airports, there's even more structure. The lighting is uniform. The flooring is uniform. You can put little tags on the floors. You can put lines on the floors, as I think they do in these hospitals, to tell the uh, little robot exactly where it needs to go. So with all that structure, of course, the task becomes a lot easier to automate. And yet, nonetheless, these robots really are automating work that humans were previously required uh, to do. And at least in a UK context, so the NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, is under enormous cost pressures. And these kinds of technologies in replacing um, you know, hospital porters are absolutely set to see deployment in the near future. Uh, just picking up on that, other places in the NHS where you're going to see automation in the near future are things like pharmacy work. So, of course, it's very easy for an algorithm to take a, a prescription slip and pull out the right medicine. That, again, is somewhere we're going to see automation in the very near future. Uh, so a point I made there but didn't really dwell on was the fact that um, whenever we deploy self-driving vehicles, autonomous vehicle technologies, when we put all these sensors and cameras and other things on them, it's not just the automation of human work. We get data from them that allows better things to happen. So I've got a slide on that as well. So when these vehicles become ubiquitous on our streets, for instance, who knows what the kind of ancillary benefits might be. So certainly there'll be advantages for uh, mapping. Certainly there'll be advantages, advantages for um, uh, insurance in uh, you know, ensuring that when a vehicle gets into an accident, there's this really quite detailed record of exactly what happened. Similarly for law enforcement, it could be these vehicles are capturing on camera things that law enforcement can use to track down the appropriate uh, uh, misdemeanor. Um, uh, I mentioned the mine example before, and the picture on the slide is from the Chelyabinsk meteorite from 2013. Does anyone remember this? Maybe a few people do. Oh, really enthusiastic arm over here. Thanks very much. <laughs> so um, if you remember this, it's probably because you saw these kind of amazing images, right, of a meteorite striking the ground somewhere in uh, remote Russia. And you might have stopped to wonder why we had these images, right? It's not like Russia has necessarily deployed this Russia-wide network of cameras to try and capture every uh, extrasolar body that strikes the ground. Um, instead, the reason we have these images is because there's been this kind of breakdown in trust amongst Russian drivers, such that it's become commonplace to put these dashboard cameras on their vehicles. So if they do get into an accident, they've got footage to back up their side of the argument. So of course, that's good for them, but it also means there are these kind of side benefits for us as a community, for the scientific community in particular, and giving us these remarkable images of um, 
you know, this scientific phenomenon. Okay, so you might be wondering at this point, perhaps you got on to discussing earlier, well, if algorithms and robots are so great, if they can dig through documents and drive vehicles, uh, what are humans actually any good for? So um, one of the components of our own work on this topic is the identification of what we call bottlenecks to automation. So we try to identify the things that are most difficult to automate in the foreseeable future. And just to be absolutely clear, we're not saying that any of these bottlenecks are in any sense fundamental. We're not saying that there is any uh, reason to expect that these things won't be automated given sufficient time. We're just trying to point to the things that at least over a horizon of 10 to 20 years are the least <coughs> likely to be replaced by um, algorithmic intelligence. So the two things I've got on the slide uh, creativity and social intelligence and so to me in a way these two things are more similar than different and the way I uh, kind of bring them together is to say that in creativity and social intelligence humans have perhaps the deepest reservoirs of tacit knowledge and by tacit knowledge I mean uh, we know how to do things without necessarily being able to say how Right? It's this kind of knowledge that's somehow ingrained in our grey matter but is not necessarily easy for us to make explicit in such a way that we could actually write it in a, in a bit of code. So let's take each of them in turn. Creativity, at least to me, requires the combination of um, you know, things from vastly different areas of our experience. Right? So an architect, for instance, might be inspired by a nature documentary that they saw the night before. And I think to really make those big leaps in innovation in originality and creativity, you need that ability to combine very different things. And really that requires a data set that is the whole of human experience, which I don't think we're anywhere near to replicating. So that's the first thing that I think is difficult about creativity, that kind of combinatorial element. The second thing I think is still quite difficult is to um, make explicit what the human utility function actually is. So certainly it's possible to have an algorithm churn out an endless sequence of songs or paintings within a particularly narrowly defined genre, but I still think it's going to be difficult to distinguish the uh, songs or paintings, whatever else, that are truly uh, you know, groundbreaking from that that is kind of ho-hum, the, the sort of dreck. I don't think we have this really good characterization of what it is that humans truly value just yet. On social intelligence, I think it's more or less the same story. Again, to distinguish um, what is possible from what's not, yes, of course, we have chatbots, but I think we're a long way away from kind of higher level human social functioning. And here I'm thinking about things like negotiation or persuasion or mentoring, right? These are all things that humans can do, uh, but not things that those same humans can necessarily make explicit in such a way that it could be automated. So um, again, I think while we'll see the state-of-the-art advance towards some of these ends, I think there are still going to be jobs for people who uh, bring these kinds of skills to their work. So managers are one example. I, I don't think we're necessarily going to see the automation of a lot of management work for the foreseeable future. Um, so the third bottleneck, the uh, final bottleneck that we identified was autonomous manipulation. So, uh, you know, this is maybe the least fundamental of those three bottlenecks, but I think it's still probably true that, you know, the robots that we have today are still relatively poor at replacing human fingers and human eyes. I mean, we're making progress, but the state of the art really relies on a lot of structure being baked into the task that's required to be done. So the places where we do see automation uh, for example, in warehouses, an example that I mentioned before. So, of course, uh, Kiva Robotics was brought out by Amazon to automate some of its warehousing work, but keep in mind what it is and isn't doing. It's moving uh, big boxes around these warehouses, but of course it's got an excellent means of working out where it is in the warehouse. It's got a uniform floor beneath it, uniform lighting above it. It doesn't have to worry too much about unlikely objects entering its uh, its path. So uh, in these warehouses, of course, they still require human pickers to do the more delicate operations of actually taking boxes off the shelf. And the 
uh, you know, robots are a long way away from being able to manipulate the objects themselves that go into those boxes. So I'm not saying that that's absolutely never going to happen within warehouse. You know, there is still sufficient structure that we might see robots able to do some of those tasks in the near future. But I think we're a long way away from things like the robotic house cleaner. So you know, there are pictures like this one from the 1950s of people saying that there would be a robot available any day now who could clean your house for you. And so I think people's intuition there was that um, you know, house cleaning was a kind of menial task. It was something that should be able to be automated. But when you break down what is actually required to clean a house, you can understand why it is that so little progress has been made towards it. So I've been kind of harping on this structure topic. And if, question at the front? Yeah. What's a What's a, well, I mean, I'm not a roboticist. Maybe some of you know more than I do on this. But I mean, well, so my post is funded by Dyson. Dyson do a lot of work on robotics for house cleaning. And even there without, you know, kind of disclosing anything that I shouldn't, it's fair to say that this is not going to happen in the, you know, very near future. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Still, 10 years, 20 years? I, I guess for something that is truly able to clean a house to the extent that a human cleaner can do, to me that feels more like 20 or more, right? I, I, maybe your opinions differ, but that, that seems very, very difficult to me. And to speak to what the difficulties are, I don't know what your home's like, but um, I've got a one-year-old at home, and uh, our floor is strewn with a variety of very unlikely objects at more or less all times of the day. It's very difficult for a robot to navigate that kind of floor. And if you think about the type of cleaning tasks that are required, so in a house, a human cleaner can distinguish a uh, dirty plate, which is required to be cleaned, from a pot plant, which contains dirt, but is not to be cleaned. That's quite subtle, right? I mean, that's something that, while we take for granted, would have to be hard-coded or learnt by an algorithm in a way that I don't think is possible with the state of the art. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's still some way away. OK, so now on to some of our own work on this topic. So, of course, being a machine learning person, what I was thinking is, well, maybe we can use a machine learning algorithm to tell us what machine learning algorithms are likely to be able to do. So back in 2013, I started a collaboration with an economist in Oxford who um, told, us about, told me about this um, fantastic data set that's available for the US called ONET. So ONET makes available 120 uh, detailed descriptions of skill requirements for around 900 different occupations. In the end, we only use 700, but that's neither here nor there. So um, to give you some example of the type of data that's available, these are the level of occupations that we have. So accountants and auditors are one, tax preparers are another. And for each of those occupations, we have these 120 numbers, a vector of 120 length. Uh, each element is between 0 and 100 and tells us about the requirement for things like persuasion or originality, social perceptiveness, fine arts. And uh, we thought that these things were exactly the kind of uh, features that might be predictive of a job's susceptibility to automation. So to be absolutely clear about what our research question was, we were trying to predict whether or not a job was automatable, at least even more precisely, most or all of its tasks were automatable by the year 2030. So what that is not saying is that this job will be automated, of course, that question requires you to think about all the other things that are going on in the economy, you know, demographic changes, changes in the patterns of trade, the relative cost of algorithm and human, all that stuff. We were just thinking about what is the technological scope of automation of work, just to be absolutely clear. And um, so the way we proceeded was to hold a workshop in Oxford, bring together robotics and machine learning people who labelled 70 of these occupations as being either automatable or not, according to that definition. And then we used a Gaussian process classifier, because that's how I roll, <laughs> to predict the uh, probability of automation for all occupations, including those in the training set, right? Because we wanted to ensure that we weren't just slavishly following the labels that were provided. We wanted to correct, in some cases, the mistaken beliefs of some of the experts, given what was observed more broadly. OK. so. Now on to my first quiz of today. 
So what I'd like you to guess is what our numbers produced for the automatability of insurance underwriters in the US. And uh, you've got four options, you know, the <laughs> is the question clear? Or? What is an insurance underwriter? Oh, someone who decides uh, how much to charge a particular customer for their particular, you know, the premium to be assigned to a particular customer for their insurance, or whether or not to give, uh, you know, give them insurance at all. Okay, so have a think about that. Let's have hands in the air on three. Three, two, one, hands up in the air, please. <laughs> Okay, so most people are not very optimistic about the prospects for insurance underwriters and our algorithm absolutely agreed with you. So the probability it gave was 99%. Um, and what I thought I might just show is the historical data for employment for this particular occupation in the US. So the uh, x-axis is time from 1985 to 2015. The y-axis uh, has two bits to it. The red is the share of employment in the US, that is the fraction of workers in this occupation. The blue dotted curve is the absolute numbers of workers in this occupation. The size of the pie in the US has undergone sustained growth, that is there are more people in the US and there are more people working, so you, you kind of expect the blue curve to continue to go up. The red curve gives the kind of relative magnitude. So what we're seeing here is that actually there hasn't been big job growth in uh, insurance underwriters, but at the same time there hasn't been a big shock perceivable in the data yet. But to me this is kind of evidence of, you know, our cho for, well, a defence for our chosen methodology. So one thing we've also done is to just take these numbers and extrapolate, uh, predict out to the year 2030 what the employment numbers will be for all these different occupations. But to me that kind of misses the really interesting things, right? Like we haven't necessarily seen the impact of autonomous vehicle technology in the employment numbers just yet, but we're pretty sure it's going to come. So to me that's you know, an argument for why we took the approach we did, but anyway. Next quiz. Um, what is the probability of automatability for mechanical engineers in the US? So hopefully everyone knows what a mechanical engineer does. Um, you know. Okay, maybe a bit more debate here. Let's give it a couple of seconds to contemplate. All right, hands in the air on three, two, one. Up in the air, please. That's quite interesting. So there's a bit of disagreement here. So some people are saying threes and fours, others are saying ones and twos. Um, okay, so the answer according to our algorithm is actually one, which is interesting. So um, we'll come to why that is maybe a little later. But um, one argument for why mechanical engineers got quite a low score, just a sec, sorry, is that for this occupation, the originality score was quite high. And our algorithm learnt that originality was actually quite protective of a job's automatability. You know, that was one of the most important features for prediction. Um, question at the back, or oh, in the middle? You talked about the question, because one thing is what the a mechanical engineer can do. Yeah. And another thing is what most mechanical engineers do in general. Yeah. So which one is this associated with? Yeah, excellent question. So the question was, are we asking about automating, uh, you know, I guess the median mechanical engineer or the potential mechanical engineer, like all the things that a mechanical engineer could potentially do? It's the former. So we're working on, you know, the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics data from the US. The ONET variables that I showed you are uh, averages across the cohort of respondents in the survey and that kind of thing. So that's what we're targeting, the, the median or mean kind of worker. Uh, wish I could be more precise. Question from Graham. Uh, Ajay Agarwal at University of Toronto, he's an economist looks at AI. He ah. has a proposal that um, he has two dimensions. One is purely cognitive tasks and the other one is purely physical tasks. And he says jobs that are either purely physical or purely cognitive are the ones that are most likely to be automated and everything sort of in between are is least likely to be automated. So if you were to do, say, a dimensionality reduction on these mm. 30 attributes, do you, would you get something that sort of those are the principal axes? Components. Like, actually you know, not, because I mean we have done that, I mean I, I don't think that's totally unintuitive, but actually having done kind of feature selection and dimensionality reduction on this data, the features that come out are most, as most important are first and foremost, far and away, originality, which kind of chimes with our, um, you know, 
prior expectations of what should be important. So that's a kind of, a kind of advanced cognitive skill, if you like. Uh, but the, mo the skill that was most complementary to that was actually assisting in caring for others rather than anything physical. So there are, there are physical um, skills in the ONET data set. There are things like finger dexterity and manual dexterity that you think might be protective uh, you know, if it was really difficult to automate um, you know, manipulation sort of tasks. But they didn't seem very helpful in, in this particular exercise. Of course, we have to recognize the limitations of the work we've done. So this was, the training set was one workshop of people in Oxford. Um, I can say that the labels they gave us were self-consistent. That is, we subdivided the training set and you know, got a reasonable um, you know, train test splits. We got a reasonable AUC, but they could be self-consistently wrong. I'll come on to why I don't think that's necessarily true later. But yeah, I mean, I, that's not to say these other hypotheses are necessarily wrong either. I think there is something to that interaction between uh, you know, kind of physical tasks and mental tasks that's quite difficult. Mm. Um, I don't know. Hmm. And as a result, human players are playing a different way now. And so what do you make of this? That if a machine you know, learns to do a task well enough, it may do so in a way that to us humans seems very creative just because it's different. Yeah. So I, I think that's absolutely true. But I guess my definition of creativity requires you know, sustained innovation, you know, making multiple big leaps. And also it requires being able to work in far less structured domains than AlphaGo was. So, you know, creativity for AlphaGo uh, <laughs> was in the context of selecting which position on a board to place a stone. So it's a discrete action space. You know exactly what the actions are. You've got a well-defined metric of success. You know whether you win or lose the game. And also you've got quite a big data set. In fact, you can generate more training data by playing the algorithm against itself. I think that's quite different from the kind of things that human workers are paid to do uh, along the lines of creativity. So, you know, uh, in the work that we do, right, it's in designing new algorithms. I'm a little skeptical that we're going to see algorithms that can automate the entire work of a machine learning scientist anytime soon. I'm skeptical even that uh, algorithms can necessarily replace uh, all the work that, um, you know, a journalist does, despite the advances that have been made in robo-journalism. Like some of the routine stuff can be done, but the thought pieces, you know, that real understanding of human society and culture, I think is a long way away. So, you know, as I say, there is this spectrum of what is possible. Certainly some algorithmic creativity is possible. Wherever you have that large training set, wherever you have the structure in the task, where I don't see creativity immediately being automated is in less structured and less well-defined tasks. Um, question? Mm. So if they write, if, they, if there's a blueprint and they put their stamp on, that means they take on that responsibility and the law requires an engineer to sign a stamp of blue and blueprints mm. before the thing is built. Mm. So, and if a mechanical engineer builds something and it fails, they bear the responsibility. A machine yeah. could not bear that responsibility. Mm. So the, the question was um, about the extent to which some of the uh, Resistance to automation might be due to the inability of current state-of-the-art algorithms to provide verification, certification of how they arrived at a, at a decision. And I think that's a hugely important topic, actually. And it's something that I think uh, you know, the machine learning community could actually do more towards if we actually want to put these algorithms to real work. Um, all that said, I think we do find ways of getting around those kinds of limitations in some places. and. Uh, you know, it, it's not clear, at least to me, when that is an important consideration and when it's not. So in, uh, you know, piloting an airplane, for instance, it's a hugely important consideration, despite the aptitude of algorithms for that task that haven't been deployed because we seem to demand this level of safety and security that's perhaps even uh, greater than what a human pilot could actually provide, as in the example of Air France disasters, you know, where the human pilot was ultimately to blame. In other cases, we don't seem to care so much about the algorithm meeting all the requirements of a, a human decision maker. Um, so sales is one example, I guess. 
uh, even in making medical decisions, you know, some of these things are being put into practice now despite not being as interpretable as a human decision maker. So I, it's a hugely important topic. I don't claim to understand it fully where that will and won't prove a bottleneck to actually introducing automation, but I absolutely agree it's something as a machine learning community we should be focusing on uh, developing. Okay, so um, back to mechanical engineers, if there are no further questions. So um, here's the employment trend for mechanical engineers, just to round that out. Uh, okay, so now onto a longer list of different occupations that uh, we considered. So the table here has three columns. The occupation is in the first. The middle column are the labels from the training set for a selected number of occupations. One means that it was labeled as being automatable. Zero means it was labeled as being non-automatable, pardon me. And you can see on the basis of those labels, the algorithm gave out numbers that seemed relatively in line with intuition. So the algorithm said that data entry keys were highly automatable, as were tax preparers. Interestingly, umpires and referees were highly automatable. Uh, and when you think about it, I mean, a lot of that is really routine decision making. And I know in my favorite sport of cricket, there's been a lot of introduction of technology in making decisions. Um, then if we uh, look at the occupations that are non-automatable, we see examples like uh, choreographers. Lawyers here, to be clear, this is the kind of trial lawyer. There are other occupations that correspond more to that legal assistant, paralegal sort of work, and they do indeed come out as more automatable. Um, financial analysts are somewhere in the middle. But I wanted to flag up some surprises that came out of this analysis. So one such surprise was waiters and waitresses. So in the workshop, uh, our participants labelled it as being non-automatable. And what we were thinking about there was the um, you know, extent to which a waiter or waitress must sort of try to persuade the customer to buy a slightly bigger meal or a slightly more expensive wine. And that kind of requirement for small talk, all that kind of thing. But um, actually, of course, as I showed at the beginning of the talk, there actually have now been some technologies put to those sort of ends. The Xeos tablet is indeed replacing some of the tasks of the waiter or waitress. So, you know, these labels were um, produced in 2013. Since then, perhaps the predictions of the algorithm have been borne out to some degree. Uh, another example I wanted to flag up was that of economists. So my co-author, as I mentioned, Cal Frey, is an economist. And he was quite keen that economists were in the training set as an example of a non-automatable occupation. As you can see, the probability the algorithm came up with was pretty close to 50-50. So I'll leave it to your own judgment there. <laughs> you know? Yeah, OK. Um, all right, so now on to slicing and dicing the results that came out in a number of different ways. To me, probably the most alarming finding of our work was the following. So what we set out to do was to link the probability of automatability to two different measures of skill. Uh, so the probability of automatability on either of these plots is on the x-axis. On the top y-axis, we've got the fraction of workers in an occupation who have at least a bachelor's degree. So the higher up the y-axis, the better educated an occupation is on average. On the bottom uh, y-axis, we've got the average median wage in an occupation. And what you can see is that there's, a, in either case, a relatively clear negative trend. So simply put, the more skilled an occupation is, the less likely they are to be automated, according to our analysis. So I, I mentioned that was alarming. And to me, it's alarming because you know, this kind of ties into other developments we've seen in the uh, exacerbation of inequality across the uh, developed world. So what this threatens is that as these technologies start to take root, take root in the economy, the people who will be replaced are exactly those workers whose skills are perhaps not up to the task of finding new work, whatever it is that's created, given that our expectations are that, that new work is likely to be more high skilled. And I'll speak to that new work in a sec. But um, this was the kind of headline figure that attracted most attention from our work. So um, to interpret this plot, again, the probability of automatability is on the x-axis, so the further to the right, the more automatable you are. The y-axis is employment, meaning the number of jobs. And so what we've done is take the entirety of US employment, all the jobs in the US, 
and turned it into, if you like, a lasagna, stratified into layers by the um, sector of employment, which are the different colors, everything from management to transportation. And then we've kind of squished the lasagna out according to its probability of computerization. So um, yeah, if you like, the total area under this plot is total employment in the US, if that helps. So, you know, take a moment to inspect the plot and to see and see which kind of figures, uh, sorry, which kind of occupations are most likely to see themselves under threat from automation. Those that seem to be most at risk fall into, for instance, transportation material, moving occupations. So, you know, those autonomous vehicles technologies might have impact there. Side note, there are 700,000 workers in the US today in what's known as the industrial truck and tractor operator occupation. So that's not necessarily intercity driving. This is people who, for instance, drive forklifts. So these are really quite structured occupations that are likely to, you know, relatively imminently come under threat from autonomous vehicle technologies. Um, we also see production occupations, so that's manufacturing work coming under threat. That's not very surprising. Uh, office and administrative support, that kind of routine clerical work that I was talking about, robotic, robotic process automation, automating. Also sales occupations and service occupations. So that service pink stripe is a little bit alarming because actually one of the most sustained engines of job growth in the last decade or so has been in the service sector. So if that goes away, there could be some um, fairly unpleasant consequences. On the left-hand side of the plot, we see the occupations that are least likely to be automated. So this includes management occupations, computer engineering and science occupations, education, legal, uh, healthcare. So all of these occupations, I would argue to at least one de some degree, have one or more of those bottlenecks that I mentioned before. But the um, kind of headline figure here that most people uh, focused on was the fact that 47% of current US employment was at high risk of automatability over this 20-year horizon, which is a, you know, a reasonable chunk. But um, I thought it might be interesting to then reproduce that analysis for a range of different countries. So we did it for a few different countries ourselves. We did it for the UK, we did it for Japan, and then other authors have taken the approach and run with it and reproduced it for more or less every country in the world at this point, including a range of developing nations. So, my next quiz asks you to uh, uh, predict which of these four developing nations has the highest fraction of its current workforce at high risk of automatability. So this is maybe a, a tougher question. Take a couple moments to consider. Interesting. Please do discuss with your neighbours if you would like. I mean, yeah. Okay, everyone. Look, I, I can see some of you are eager to have their opinions known. So maybe we could have a first stab at this. On a count of three, please, hands in the air with the option that you think is correct. Let's get a survey of the audience. Three, two, one, hands in the air. Okay, so I'm seeing a few fours, some twos, some ones. There's a fair amount of divergence in the audience. Uh, so according to our analysis, in fact, the correct answer was three, Ethiopia. Uh, right, so to dig into that a little bit, it might be difficult to see, but obviously you'll get access to these slides later. Um, this is the list of all countries that was considered, all developing nations on the x-axis. This is the fraction of workers in that country that are at high risk of automatability. Ethiopia sits right over to the right there. The reason for that is basically that 90% of Ethiopian workers still work in agriculture. So uh, you know, these are occupations that in the developed world have already been automated, right? You know, there was this agricultural revolution in the 20th century, which I'll turn to in a bit, which basically eliminated all those jobs in the US and the UK. Ethiopia is just not yet caught up. So if that technology is really put to work, you know, a lot of those jobs will come under threat. And returning to that theme of, um, you know, the exacerbation, at least potentially, of inequality, it seems to hold up even at a cross-national level as well. So what we've got here on the x-axis is the fraction of a country's employment which is at high risk and on the y-axis the uh, 2014 GDP per capita in USD uh, for those different nations. 
And you can see a kind of negative trend there. So, um, in fact, Ethiopia sits right out to the right. It's a very poor country. And, um, you know, it seems to me that the poorest countries are indeed those that are potentially most affected by automation. So, of course, the, the obvious rejoinder to that is that, well, you know, you don't have to pay Ethiopian workers that much, right? So, you know, will it actually make economic sense to deploy um, a robot to do that job? And it's a good argument, but what I would say is that increasingly the kind of technologies we're seeing are driven by software. And as we all know, software has essentially zero marginal cost. That is, once you've written the software once, it can be reproduced for almost nothing. And so I think as competitive market pressures are brought to bear on these kinds of problems, we will see a lot of software solutions that are replacing work delivered very, very cheaply. So I think a lot of these occupations will be automated, even if the current workers aren't paid that much. Uh, maybe not those Ethiopian farmers, but in many other occupations at least. If the software lives in an ecosystem that needs to be managed, so you do have fixed costs, online costs, and earnings, the marginal cost is really zero. It's maybe to the software, but not to the infrastructure that's supporting it. Yeah, no, fair point. So the, the question was about, the other kind of infrastructure costs associated with the delivering service, and I don't mean to minimize those, but at the same time, those are kind of coming down as well, right, with cloud computing, for instance. Also, I think there will be big firms that will be able to pay these costs. I mean, some of the occupations we're talking about, automating accountants and auditors, for instance, are very highly paid. It's easy to imagine those infrastructure costs being a very small fraction of the current wage for some of the occupations that are being replaced. Maybe, maybe I can, maybe I was, drawing a little bit too long a bow when talking about these developing nation occupations, and thanks for making the point. Um, okay, so I, I mentioned this kind of agricultural revolution that played out throughout the 20th century, and just to put some numbers on exactly the scale of that phenomenon. So in the year 1900, 40% of US workers were engaged in agriculture, which dropped to actually less than 5%, uh, sorry, in fact, to 2% <laughs> by the end of the 20th century. Um, but nonetheless, there didn't seem to be an enormous shock to unemployment as a result. So the unemployment rate at the beginning of the 20th century in the US was about 5%. At the end of the 20th century, it was about 5%. And, you know, a lot of people look at uh, the historical record and say, well, actually, historically, we seem to have been pretty good at coming up with new uses for human labor, even as technology has automated away uh, different types of work. So I guess one core question is, will these new technologies threaten that historical pattern of uh, human labor outracing, if you like, the advance of technology? And I've got my own answers to that that we'll come to. Um, so this is a plot for the UK, which took our numbers of the automatability of UK occupations um, and then related it to what had actually happened in those occupations over the last 15 years, more precisely from the year 2000 to 2015. So the uh, probability of automatability again is on the x-axis. On the y-axis, it's the change in employment in those occupations. And what we see is actually that that historical story seems to have been borne out to some degree. So there have been uh, 3.5 million jobs created uh, in occupations uh, <laughs> that we identified as being at low risk of automatability, and only 800,000 jobs lost in occupations that we identified as being at high risk of automatability. So adding those two numbers together, you see actually there has been net job growth in the UK. So I think you know, there will potentially continue to be such job growth, but again, I think the risk here is not one of mass joblessness, but of that exacerbation of inequality, because it is exactly those occupations that we identified as being at high risk, which as I said was kind of linked to low skill, that have seen job losses, even over the last 15 years without the full force of machine learning and robotics, to give one example, having been uh, you know, brought to the, the labor market. Sorry, question? Mm. Right, which then would lead to the conclusion that you are not exacerbating inequality if that's the yeah. case. Yeah, absolutely true. Happening? 
I, I don't think it is because we haven't got that much, well, we haven't had a lot of success in increasing education levels in the developed world. So, so the fraction of the population that's um, got a tertiary education is kind of flatlined for the last decades, at about 50%, oh sorry, that's high school education. Similar for tertiary, ed oh, that's, sorry, I'm getting my facts mixed up. That is for tertiary education, about 50%. Similar for high school education, at about 90%. And despite all the money that's been thrown into tertiary education, thrown into high school education, we don't seem to have been able to lift up the bottom end of the distribution to higher degrees of skill. I'm relatively skeptical of our ability to uh, continue to realise much societal benefits from reskilling in education. I don't see necessarily it being a total um, cause to abandon. I think we do want to think about education, but I don't think it's the silver bullet solution either. So maybe some of that's in this data, but I don't think it's a big component. I think the biggest component actually is, um, in the UK's case, uh, immigration more than anything else, with high skilled workers moving to occupy in particular professional occupations. Um, I moved to the UK to occupy a professional occupation, for instance. I think that's a large part of what that data shows. So, so you really think the immigrants moving into the UK are fitting into those higher skilled jobs? Yeah, absolutely. The data support this? Uh, I mean, it's not the story I'm hearing in, in North America. Uh, well, the UK is different from North America, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> That, that's a whole other topic. I mean, I, I haven't dug into this data in particular to be able to give you the, the in-depth answer I would like. I guess my major point is just that that upskilling, I, th I think it's dangerous to focus too much on that upskilling, basically, as a solution to the problems that automation poses. Because even with the best education system in the world, there are going to be some people who are left behind, right? But, but in a sense, yeah. that's what's happening in your other data, if you compare mm. the farming data from you know, early 20th century to late 20th century. Right. It would be upscaling by, by the current definition that people are moving out of farming and are yeah. working, moving into sales and clerical and so on, which are the more, and so. Yeah. And now we're talking about a different shift from sales and service to some of these other jobs, but, but that's, that was the major phenomenon in the 20th century. Yeah, that is true. This is beyond the 20th century, of course. Right. Yeah. Um, let me speak to the new work topic, which maybe will give some further answers to this. So the, the first, so, um, Obviously there have been new forms of work created and the first thing to talk about is entirely new types of occupations that have been delivered in part by technological change. So <laughs> I can see a few giggles. This is LinkedIn's list of new occupations that have been created. It's a weird and wonderful list. It includes iOS developers alongside Zumba instructors, data scientists. Flipping over the slide, we also get beach body coaches and <laughs> Cloud service specialists. So I, I don't mean to minimize this effect. There, there will be entirely new types of work that are very difficult for us to predict today that are created, in fact, by technology. But one thing I would say is that even in these occupations, there hasn't yet been enormous amounts of job growth. So the, the job figures you can kind of see uh, in the slide, they're not enormous, right? Uh, these are not necessarily big employers just yet. And that's borne out in other ways to slice what's gone on in the US over the last uh, few decades. So these are some really quite interesting numbers and uh, they're produced by um, Jeffrey Lin and my co-author Carl Frey. So what these numbers show is the fraction of the US workforce that is engaged in new industries by decade. So in particular, the first number, 8.2%, says that 8.2% 8, 8 of workers at the end of the 1980s were employed in industries that didn't exist at the beginning of the 1980s. In the 1990s, that figure dropped to 4.4%. So the new industries that were created didn't seem to be as helpful in generating job growth. And for the 2000s, that number has dropped to just half of 1%. And you might think, well, the US is a big and heterogeneous place. Even in Silicon Valley, that number is 1.8% for the 2000s. So to me, this speaks to the fact that for all the hype about the tech industry, it's not a replacement for, say, General Motors, right? 
the tech industry is not generating jobs at a scale sufficient to replace what has come before it. So to give some numbers on that, you know, WhatsApp was bought out uh, by Facebook at uh, a point at which it had 55 employees. Uh, its valuation at that point was 19 billion US, so this is a bit arbitrary, but to take a company of similar valuation, uh, Gap, the fashion retailer, also worth about 19 billion US, has 137,000 employees. So I'm a little bit skeptical that you know, these new industries, these new forms of work are going to be the replacement to the woes here. Um, nonetheless, it's important to say just looking at uh, you know, the number of jobs is only a partial metric of whether or not things have gotten better or worse. And to that, I think this is a really important plot. Uh, I'd like to show you the fraction of people who are employed as lawn dressers in uh, private US households in hundreds as a function of time all the way from 1850 to the 1990s. So you can see as the US got wealthier, there was this big spike in employment in lawn dresses. And then uh, in 1910, there was a patent granted for the very first electric washing machine. And then there was this precipitous decline in uh, employment for lawn dresses. So one way of looking at that is to say, oh, it was a disaster, right? These jobs were removed, but lawn, you know, being a lawn dress was not a pleasant occupation. It required you know, dragging clothes out to the nearest river, uh, or in other cases, bringing water into the home in order to wash clothes by hand, which was an enormously you know, manually intensive and unpleasant sort of task. And you know, once these technologies truly were able to release um, lawn dressers from their work, and tied into a wide variety of other technological developments, this was part of the, <laughs> what enabled women to enter the workforce in the US, right? Which it's impossible to consider as anything but an enormous boon to society as a whole. So, you know, I, I think there has to be some caution in interpreting job numbers, um, you know, alone. We do need to consider the characteristics of a job as well and what that means for the quality of work and for the impacts on society at large. So my next slide is a plot from uh, Our World in Data. If you haven't checked out Our World in Data, I would really encourage you to do so. It's a web publication deployed by the um, Institute for New York Economic Thinking, in particular by Max Rosa, who's a colleague in the Oxford Martin School in Oxford. In fact, he works on the same floor as me. Um, so this is a plot of the uh, household income of different strata in the US um, population distribution. So the more blue an occupation is, the higher up it is in the distribution of household income. And the more red it is, the lower it is in that distribution. And the story you see here pretty clearly is that household incomes for um, the kind of lowest paid workers have basically stagnated. There was a bit of a spike up in the late 1990s, but since then the story has been uh, actually of declining wages for the bottom half of the distribution. And uh, you know, even looking further back, it, there wasn't all that much job growth through the 80s or early 90s either. So really the winners of the last four decades have been the top income earners, right? So it's the people who are already earning the most who have kind of realized the uh, value delivered by technological change and the other developments in society. And um, returning to that historical question about us always being able to create new forms of work, this, this bears up even if we kind of look way further back in, uh, in history. So this is another amazing plot from our world and data, which considers the um, fraction of income paid in the UK, well, in England, and Wales actually, and I think uh, only from 1918, the United Kingdom, but you know, broadly the same region. The fraction of income that's paid to the top 5% of individuals. So obviously the higher up that number is, the more unequal society is, if you like. A larger fraction of the pie is carved off by the most uh, well paid. And it's interesting because this data captures the English Industrial Revolution, right? which kicks off maybe somewhere about here 
and keeps going right into the 19th century. So this was a time of more or less unprecedented technological change in which there were enormous increases in productivity, in which new forms of work were being created all over the place. But nonetheless, the value that was delivered from those technologies wasn't captured by the workers themselves. So actually, despite those enormous increases in productivity, the winners seem to be the top 5%, right? This line is actually going up. So by some estimates, it took something like 70 years after the um, onset of the um, Industrial Revolution for workers in England to see any rise in real wages at all. So, you know, I think when people say, well, you know, we've always kind of got through technological change in the past, you have to consider that it wasn't always easy and it wasn't always to the benefit of everyone. So the only reason we got through the English Industrial Revolution was with quite seismic structural and institutional change. So to give just one example, there was a ban put on child labor that prevented some of the more exploitative aspects of that Industrial Revolution. In the um, Agricultural Revolution in the 20th century, the farm states in the US were really the driving force between universal secondary education, because of course, it was their, um, their children effectively who were being put out of work by the advances in technology and they wanted to see uh, you know, increased uh, education to let them move into a new kind of uh, office work that was created. So I think we are probably going to need to think about changes at that sort of scale to manage what I see as similar um, magnitude changes in technology that are ahead. Okay, so just to conclude, I thought I'd have some actual maths. You know, this is a machine, well, deep learning summer school after all. But my favorite type of maths, as you might have guessed yesterday, is decision theory. So the particular decision I want you to consider is that of a firm who is considering whether or not to invest in automating a particular occupation. So the game they play is, well, we can spend some money to um, try and produce technology to automate this occupation. And then there's a coin flip which is whether or not they do actually succeed, whether or not the occupation is automatable. If they succeed, the reward is the total number of workers in that occupation, N, times the, um, the wage, the average wage in that occupation. So they kind of carve off some fraction of the total wage bill for that occupation if they succeed. So um, I've actually run those numbers uh, for our analysis, and uh, it may not come as a surprise that accountants and auditors were top of the list. But um, I think this way of thinking also gives a useful framework for predicting what's going to happen in the future. And uh, this is my final slide. It's in some uh, ways inspired by Ryan Avent's, uh, to my mind, excellent book, The Wealth of Humans from last year. So what he points to is a trilemma of automation, which is that if you consider the characteristics of a job, looking ahead, it's probably only going to have uh, two of three desirable characteristics. That is, it could be numerous, there could be lots of workers in that job, it could be non-automatable, and it could be well paid, but it's probably not going to be all three. So the reasons for that are you know, kind of obvious, uh, at least in this clinical sort of um, analytical framing, in that if there is a job that is very well paid and uh, creates a lot of employment, that is a huge target, right, for anyone who is trying to automate it. So accountants and auditors, you know, in some senses, uh, you know, it's going to require a bit of work to do, but because the pie is so big, because there are so many people who do a high paid occupation, there are going to, people, there are going to be people who try and automate that job. Uh, at the same time, there could be jobs that are um, non-automatable and well paid. So. Uh, to uh, flatter myself and some of the audience, maybe machine learning scientists are amongst them. Um, but they're probably not going to be that numerous because, uh, you know, these are jobs that are sort of at the, you know, again, maybe uh, flattering here, the, the top end of the skill distribution, according to that analysis that I showed earlier. So they're not necessarily going to be big engines of job growth, like the tech sector has not proved to be a big engine of job growth. And the final thing that we could see is a whole load of jobs that are non-automatable, 
but aren't necessarily well paid. And to me, this is the story of the kind of rise of the service sector. So they're probably going to continue to be people like dog washers or, um, you know, uh, uh, gardeners, to take another example, that are non-automatable, but they're not necessarily going to be well paid. And to me, the reason for that is that they require things that are non-automatable, but they require relatively commodity level uh, human skill. So the kind of things that to some degree most people can do, they're not necessarily going to be well paid as a, as a result. So that's the kind of gloomy scenario I see ahead. Um, there are going to be real challenges to inequality that result from this. And as I said earlier, I think the answers lie in coming up with new institutional responses. We, we are going to have to rethink how we um, you know, distribute income, perhaps how we do uh, education in order to tackle these you know, really quite profound changes. Thanks very much for your attention. At this point, I'm very happy to take questions.